Hello, we're rolling into another episode of the DRH show. As usual, I talk to interesting people within psychology, mental health, and well-being. Today, I'm joined by a researcher whose work focuses on changing the conversation with respect to how people lead within organizations. He's a senior lecturer at Monash University in Australia, Dr. Nathan Eva. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Dennis. I'm really excited to be on the show and uh, thank you for um, spending time down under. Yeah, thank you. It's great to have you here, Dr. Eva. Let's start off with you telling us your background, your trajectory in life and how you ended up doing what you're doing. No worries. Uh, it's interesting. When you asked this question to me, it got me thinking, you know, why have I gotten to where I've gotten? And I think for a lot of people, especially in leadership roles, uh, why we end up where we are happens quite early on in life. And so for me, I grew up in a small country town in Victoria near Phillip Island. Um, for those of you at home who are wondering where that is, you'll know where the Hemsworths were born. Um, I'm, you know, uh, grew up close to them. Uh, so uh, as part of that, being in a small country town, you're not really exposed that much to the different, uh, different leaders, different types of leaders, and also different sorts of careers. Um, there and when i was about 15 or 16 i was sent on a leadership development camp um up in sydney so uh, it's, a, it's a flight it's about three hours north from where i was and it was the first time that i really engaged deeply in leadership it was just something that mm -hmm. i found incredibly incredibly interesting um and it wasn't until university uh, i started off as a politics student um, and performing arts student so i spent um, time doing that and ended up dropping into a class uh, that a friend of mine was taking in management, uh, being in leadership. And I go, are you kidding me? You can actually study this sort of thing. You can actually go and en engage in this sort of thing on a daily basis. That's awesome. Uh, so I ended up doing that as um, a subject. I ended up getting into a um, research master's degree. Uh, it was around the time of the um, global financial crisis. So I did quite well in the research master's degree. And as the job market looked pretty bad, I went out and did a PhD. Um, spent a little bit of time in industry after doing my PhD in leadership and leadership development, which was a lot of fun and learned a lot of things. I was a consultant at Accenture, learned a lot of different things about how we develop and train people, um, what's going on in industry and the like, and thought, well, there's actually some big issues here that I would like to try and change within organisations. I still think that we're focusing on the wrong types of leadership, that we're, focused, we're teaching leadership in the wrong way. And so an opportunity came back to um, came up to go back to Monash University and be a uh, professor there, or a lecturer there. And um, I took the opportunity and I've been there now six years and I've abs absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. um, as part of my job, I get to fly all around the world talking to people about leadership, you know, like, your, mm -hmm. like yourself, Dennis. And um, I couldn't think of something that I'd, uh, I'd more rather be doing. Brilliant. You, you already mentioned to us what um, the core of your work is. You mentioned that you kind of reshape the notion of leadership and a lot of it is, you know, involving a lot of work in leadership development. But if you could just give us um, a snapshot of what leadership development is. Yeah, no worries. Um, leadership development and leader development more broadly um, is pretty much how we develop people as leaders in a really boring sort of definition. Um, but we look at this from two different ways. One, we look at it from a leader development. So how are we developing you, Dennis? How are we making you a better leader? And as part of that, it's going to be that a lot of that insular stuff, that self-awareness. Who am I? Why am I here? Why am I leading in this way? What are my values? What do I want to achieve? What am I good at? So really focusing in on the self part, so your leader identity, um, your motivation to lead and the like. Mm -hmm. The other part is that leadership development stuff, which, you know, if you've been to any sort of management courses, a lot of the time it's going to be around that. So things like building up your public speaking skills or your mm -hmm. charisma skills or your problem solving strategy, all those sort of things. So we talk about them differently. And when we're trying to develop holistic leaders, we try and do both. We try and do some leader development and then also some leadership development as well. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Eva, on one of your one of the articles that you've published online, you mentioned about egocentric leadership paradigm, and I, I think what you tend to characterize it is that it's a romantic notion of leadership. So, if you could just unpack it a bit more. No worries. I think that's a 
that's a it's a, a bit of fancy academic speak there. I'm so sorry about that, Dennis. Uh, so what I what I'm meaning there is that a lot of the time when we think about leaders, we think about uh, these grand leaders like your Steve Jobs, like your Elon Musks, like mm-hmm. your Richard Branson in the world, who have changed shape and done amazing things. There is no doubt about that. But a lot of the time, there's still an insular um, idea that it's, you know, it's about me. Um, and I think, you know, Branson has an incredible, incredible brand with um, Virgin. And, mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, one of the things I've always worried about is what happened when Brant? What happens when Branson goes? Mm. Because for me, Branson is Virgin, and are we going to see? Um, you know, once he steps away from that company, like we saw with Jack Welch the first time with GE, um, are we going to see issues with Virgin start to emerge because it's built on the back of one person? So when I'm talking egocentric leadership, I'm talking about leaders who mm. are a lot of the time in it for themselves, in it for um, you know a little a little bit of glory, and that real focus on that individual rather than Mm. thinking about what is the, who are the broader leaders within that organization? How, you know, how are we working as a team to achieve our collective goals rather than just that um, glory of being that one individual? Mm -hmm. And is that what you, is the opposite of that is what you would call ethical leadership? I wouldn't say the opposite is ethical leadership because I Mm. definitely think you can be. And the people I was talking about generally have been quite ethical. Mm. Um, So I don't think that it's uh, the um, the opposite in that sense. I think that there does need to be a shift in leadership Mm. from where we are so focused on a the um, romanticization of particular leaders, the glorification of leaders and saying that, you know, this person is the greatest human being. People are fallible. We are going to make mistakes and we make mistakes regularly. And it's important as leaders that we're open and honest about those. We're being vulnerable when we are making mistakes because it means that other people can emulate us um, and try and emulate what we're doing in, in leadership, which is really important. Mm-hmm. And so when you're talking about sort of what what is that opposite, mm-hmm. I would be saying that it's... M- rather than just narrowly focusing on yourself or your own brand, it's focusing more broadly on who are my followers? How am I developing my followers? How am I impacting the community around me? And how am I developing my organization? So it is sustainable long-term once I leave and once I hand it off to the next person. Mm-hmm. Now let, let's talk about something more um, current and something more relevant. Um, um, of course, the pandemic, the lockdown. Um, I, I suppose you get asked these questions during this time. So um um, right now, the lockdown has been is done for most countries, but I, I would understand in Australia and here in Britain, um, it's coming to, um, it, we're, we're having another lockdown again. So can you give us some tips on how to, you know, how to go back to the workplace um, in light of the current situation that, you know, it's in limbo? Yeah, no worries. Um, so, Dennis, just to clarify the question there, are you talking about as we're still working from home or are we talking about the transition back to the workplace? I'm, I'm talking about the transition, transition in light of the, you know, that could be a second spike any time. <laughs> no. Oh, geez, that's a, that's a wor- worrying sign, Dennis. Uh, no worries. Um, I think it's going back to a lot of the basic behaviours. Mm-hmm. When crisis is hit, a lot of the time, Um, we constrict and we go, okay, I need to control. I need to micromanage. I've sat with so many leaders over the last couple of months and it's become a lot more of those micromanaging behaviors Mm -hmm. because I need to control something because everything out here I can't control, but I can control here. We need to start letting go of that. There's a reason that we've spent all this time developing our followers. There's been a reason that we're spending all this time empowering our employees. Um, It's for times like this. It's for times when things go wrong. So, you know, in the transition back to work, going back to our regular sort of behaviours, empowering employees, um, trusting them. Uh, Right now, there's a lot of flux around things like childcare, around um, caring of um, elderly relatives, Uh, things around, you know, when we can get to supermarkets, medical appointments, all these sort of things. And we need to have a lot more flexibility than what we've had in the past. You've hired your team for a reason. Um, trust them. Trust that you trust yourself that you've brought the best people on, that you've set them in the right direction, and that they are going to be able to achieve it. Mm-hmm. The you, other thing is, mm-hmm. sorry, go, Dennis. So sorry. <laughs> oh, the other thing. The other thing is that uh, those um, behaviours 
that we, we just recently published an article on this, those mm-hmm. informal feedback behaviors. So having those discussion, um, having those discussions with people saying, Hey, listen, Dennis, you're doing a really good job here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, things are going really, going really well. Just going back to those normal behaviors that we, you would in a normal workplace environment and making sure that we're not forgetting all the good things that we've, um, that we've been doing over the last few years. Mm-hmm. Well, I was just going to ask because a lot of your work, you're helping and um, g- giving trainings to a lot of companies in Australia. So um, could you paint us a picture of what's the dominant leadership style found in most companies in Australia? It's really hard to generalize, mm-hmm. uh, but I would say that, and this isn't just in Australia, I will say that the companies work within the US and in the UK and different parts of Asia as well, is that as much as we talk about empowerment, we still have a bit of a command and control that the mm-hmm. leaders tend, the power still focus um, is focused in around the leader, that there isn't as much trust for our employees as there should, um, as there should be. And um, we, and yeah, that, sorry, I'm just going to go back to command and control. That really mm-hmm. tends to be the still the majority um, side. Uh, and what worries me about this is that a lot of the times people will say to me, oh, well, in my industry, that doesn't, um, you know, uh, being compassionate as a leader doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, looking after my employees, oh, listen, I just don't have time for that. Or, um, you know, it, it's just not what we do in our industry. That's a big issue. That's a big issue that we have systemic um, problems with our organisations that leadership other than, you know, Dennis, you must do this or I'm going to fire you. Mm -hmm. uh, How is an organisational sustainable if that's going to be the leadership approach that we're using into a new generation where we need people to be innovative? We need people to be creative in their jobs on a daily basis. We need them to go above and beyond for the organisation. You've got so much mobility right now that... Mm -hmm. Why, you know, why would you stay under a bad boss um, when, you know, hopefully there's lots of different options uh, and different bosses out there for you to work under? And this leadership style that you mentioned, is it more tied into a certain sector or is it like it's, it's all over? Um, listen, it, it sort of depends. And obviously uh, the, the people who are watching at home right now, they're mm. probably in organisations which do have a much flatter structure, a much more empowering leadership approach. And, you know, the sector that I work in, in academia, to a certain extent, we have that. And it's the same with consulting. That yeah. as a consultant, you get to go into a lot of different organisations and you start to see that the little bubble that we're in, mm-hmm. it is such a little bubble. Um, and so while we have these conversations about, oh, how far are we moving forward in terms of um, representation and, you know, and what we're doing for our employees and the work-life balance and things like this, um, there are so many companies, and I would say the majority of companies, that aren't there yet, that are still a long way behind. And part of my role as an academic and part of, you know, your role of your viewers at home, Dennis, is being able to have those conversations with people, being able to share the knowledge that we have and demonstrate that um, approaching leadership with compassion, approaching leadership with empowerment and approaching leadership by putting your employees first has has a greater short-term and long-term benefits, not only just for profit, but for innovation, for um, going above and beyond, uh, for well-being, for, you know, reducing burnout, reducing stress and the like. We've got the research there. It's now about sharing it with everyone. Mm-hmm. Now, you also work with um, another researcher who I just interviewed the other day, um, Dr. Hannah Meacham, and um, much of our work revolved uh, around inclusive approach um, to leadership. And I understand you also do a bit of work within that um, area. And um, so wh- why would this kind of inclusive approach can have a long lasting impact on leadership? <laughs> It's, it's interesting, and I'm not wanting to use your words back there, but mm. because you feel included, mm. because um, when I think about bosses that I've had, and you th- think about bosses that you've had, Dennis, that sometimes, mm. you know, we get told, go and do this particular job, go and do this particular thing, um, uh, and you go and do it because you, you're trying to get a paycheck. Mm. Um, and, you know, you'll put in a certain amount of effort because, you know, you need, you need, to, need to feed the family, you need to, uh, you know, uh, get, get that paycheck in. Then you go and work for different organisations and different leaders where the conversation becomes different. Mm-hmm. That Dennis, not only, um, you know, I want you to do the same job, Dennis, but 
the reason that you're doing it is X, Y, and Z. So, you know, you might be um, working on a spreadsheet, but this is what happens when you go and um, you're going to do this. And for me, a um, really nice example, I was working for a train, uh, train company doing some leadership development training there. And one of the, um, one of the, uh, managers that I was working with had a real issue with a particular employee and the employee had to essentially purchase parts for trains. That's what they did all day. Um, uh, apparently just generally quite slow, long lunch breaks, um, you know, leaving early, turning up late, all those partic- all those sort of things about a disengaged worker. So, well, what do they know about, the, you know, the train parts? You know, what, what, what do they actually know? They're like, well, you know, they don't leave the office. And what if we, what if we change this around a bit, a little bit? Let's have a discussion with them about what this means and the impact that they're actually having. And he's going, oh, what if I take him out to the train yard? Yes, yes, do that. And so we've gone down to the train yard and this employee is being able to see what happens when, you know, they might take a 15 minute um, break and delay ordering a particular part, what that actually means um, down the line, what it means, you know, when they go above and beyond and go and help someone out um, in the ordering process, how it actually helps people um, further down the line and giving people that meaning is incredibly important um, that they feel included in the process that they know where the organization's going why they're doing what they're doing and they get a sense of meaning from their work Mm -hmm. and we know that meaning um, increases performance we know meaning increases uh, commitment to stay in the organization so yes it might take just that little bit longer to have that chat to um, an employee, but it pays off massively um, in the long run for organisations mm-hmm. on top of, you know, being the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And what would you say is the most difficult part of being a leader? <sighs> Loving your followers unconditionally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not a parent dentist, but uh, one, of the, um, one of my colleagues that uh, when, we, when we talk about this particular question, he gets, gets asked and he goes, well... It's like when I'm working with my kids, um, you know, they might frustrate me at times, um, but I have to just love them unconditionally. I have to accept them for who they are, um, warts and all. And uh, with our, with leadership, I think that that's a big part of it is this is my team. Uh, this is who I've got in front of me. I just have to, I have to learn to love them. I have to learn to, you know, work out their quirks and work out how to best uh best do things for them how do i best communicate with them on an individual basis and that is the that is a big tough part of leadership i noticed that you use the word followers and um, what's the rationale behind that it kind of like you know remind me of the social media landscape <laughs> um that's a really good question. I think it's just more convention. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that's just a convention thing in leadership. Um, I try to tend to stay away from employees. I definitely don't use the word subordinates. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I guess when we talk about leadership, often we talk about that sort of leader follower relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, so generally I'll go back to that. There's no, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's more an academic thing. Sorry about that. Okay, that's right. <laughs> and um, how, how do you go about resolving conflict? I hope um, you, you get to ask these questions a lot. Um, you know, when you give your training and consultancy projects? Uh, There's, so there is not one silver bullet. And I know Mm. that there's lots of different trainings, you know, the four steps here are, there is no silver bullet. Anyone who's managed a team will know that, you know, sometimes conflict is really easy. You know, I can just sit there, I can listen to them, listen to what the person has to say, um, repeat things back to them. It's not about the person as a whole. It's about um, the action. You know, uh, Dennis, the action um, uh, that you did, you know, this is the impact that it had on me. This is the impact it had on the team. You know, I know that you want to do the right thing. You know, it just changed this particular action. All, all those sort of things. We know that works for rational followers, rash, um, rational people. A lot of the time we don't deal with rational followers and rational people and it does, and conflict um, resolution does get a lot harder in that stage. Um in terms of uh, tricks, tips, and the like, um, listening's really um, listening, listening, listening would be the main uh, main things that I'd always be going back to. Um, trying not to judge, um, trying not to go into um, a lot of those meetings angry. Uh, I always loved this example from one of the people I've worked with. Um, uh, when she, whenever she had like the phone call from, you know, Dennis, it comes up on her phone that Dennis is calling rather than picking it up straight away because she's having you know a particular conflict with Dennis. She'll wait a few seconds, breathe, 
put now. Don't think about the emotion that she wants to put on and then uh, take, take the phone call after that. I always like that one as a, as a nice one to make sure that when I'm going into any sort of conflict resolution meetings or just someone I have conflict with in general, mm-hmm. that I try and be in, you know, the most positive uh, mood that I can be to try and set off those good vibes. Um, again, there is no silver bullet. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's great readings across the board. Um, understanding your followers and understanding uh, where they're coming from is going to be the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Now, Dr. Eva, you recently published a piece for the conversation that says crisis refines leadership. Can you tell us more about this? Sure thing, Dennis. So this piece was, um, it was really interesting, this piece, mm-hmm. because we, when we originally wrote it, it was during um, the bushfire crisis mm-hmm. uh, here in Australia. And it's about um, how our, prim- um, our prime minister reacted to the bushfire crisis. And at the time, it was actually quite a negative piece because um, at that stage that there was a complete lack of compassion, um, a lack of empathy coming, coming through. And uh, Funnily enough, at the time we were just about to publish it, the editors pushed back and said, oh, listen, coronavirus has just happened. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens this week. And we saw a very, very different Prime Minister Morrison um, that week. Um, So in terms of when we talk about crisis um, redefining leadership, is that a crisis gives a leader an opportunity to essentially have a blank slate, to be able to have an impact. If you think, you know, if we think historically, um, uh, Churchill, um, Mm. that World War II completely redefined Mm. the way in which we think about Churchill's leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the piece that I wrote was specifically around that. So how how the change from the bushfire crisis to the coronavirus um, crisis and how a a shift in compassion and empathy really, really worked for uh, Morrison. And his approval ratings um, just skyrocketed. Uh, We're talking about a guy who wouldn't have been able to run for the local dog catcher um, in the middle of the bushfire crisis to the start of, um, to, you know, a couple of weeks into the coronavirus crisis, would have been re-elected in a landslide. Um, While crises are never good at the best of times, Mm -hmm. as leaders, it gives them the opportunity to be able to exert the leadership abilities and skills that they might have been holding in their back pocket. Mm -hmm. So would you say that there would be inspiring trends that would emerge out of the coronavirus (laughs) crisis? Uh, Listen, I think that that's a, I think that's a really tough, tough one because I think that, you know, we could think of examples of people who, um, that, things have emerged that have been fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think that everyone has their own personal example of a local business Mm -hmm. or maybe a GP or maybe a um, a local school teacher who's done an incredible job during this um, this time. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know, we can wheel out um, prime ministers. Um, I will get her name wrong, but if you do not know the prime minister of Finland, it is, she is worth looking up. She is spectacular. Um, She has done an incredible job. Uh, Prime minister Ardern over New Zealand. Um, uh, and then we can talk about people who have not done very well in this crisis. Again, we can start pointing fingers at particular countries. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Dennis. Um, we can start uh, pointing fingers at particular organisations who have focused more on uh, focus more on the individuals at the top rather than the workers as a whole, or on um, or on the community at large. And I, you know, um, I think the US has given us so many examples of this, mm-hmm. um, even through the organisations who said, um, who took money from the government as part of um, paycheck protection programs and the like, who probably did not need it um, in the end and ended up costing small businesses uh, the opportunity. Mm-hmm. So um, as, a re- as a researcher, what, what changes would you like to see implemented um, within the HR within the leadership um, landscape within, let's say, the next 10 years? It's a really interesting question, and I'll probably answer it a little bit differently, mm-hmm. is I would like the performance and promotion process changed. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that if we talk about how do we change leadership, we need to change the reward and um, structure. Mm-hmm. You brought up ethical leadership before. And when I talk ethical leadership and, I go, um, and people ask, you know, how do we make leaders more ethical? Mm-hmm. Change, you re- change your performance system in an organisation. The moment you reward people for engaging in unethical behaviour um, is the moment where they go and engage in unethical behaviour. 
but hey, Nathan, you know, no one writes in, you know, go and screw over people. And uh, so, you know, uh, screw over people uh, to, you know, make money. Well, you don't have to write it in like that. You just need to write in the fact that, you know, uh, we're going, if you go and make X amount of dollars, we're going to give you X sort of bonus. If you don't regulate how people go and do it, people are going to find a way. Um, that we need to think about um, how we're um, offering our bonuses, how we're setting up our um, performance procedures and how we're setting up promotion to make sure that we get the leadership approaches that we want to come through. If you want an ethical approach, you need to be writing that into your codes of conduct and how you're promoting people. If you want um, leaders who focus on the development and growth of their employees, that takes time. And you need to write that into performance and promotion procedures. Uh, so I can talk all day about, you know, how we change up our leadership development, but I think that that's incredibly, incredibly important. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I'd say, Dennis, is we need to be reshaping how we think about who gets to engage in leadership. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, it would be really, really easy for me to continue writing articles um, and talking to people about, oh, you know, let's just continue to do things how we've always done them and how, let's continue to lead in the ways that we've always done. Mm -hmm. The reason it's really easy for me is because it perpetuates an idea of leadership for this, for white males and white males only. Mm -hmm. If we're serious about diversity, if we are serious about inclusion, mm -hmm. we cannot keep saying, um, you need to be a charismatic leader, that you need to act just like your jobs or your Bransons or your Musks, um, that we need to bring, we need to broaden out what it means to be a leader. We need to redefine what it means to be a leader and we need to stop tearing down every person who does not perfectly fit into the mould of white male performance-driven leader mm -hmm. every time they make a particular mistake. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I just... We can, uh, you know, we just need to look at our global leaders. Um, that uh, the level of um, the level of uh, the, the amount of rope that we give to people like um, uh, Prime Minister Johnson over in the UK or Prime Minister Morrison here um, in Australia, compared to um, their previous female counterparts, is um, is astronomical. Um, and until we have uh, start having a serious conversation about that and start to call out these things and start to think about what are the systemic problems that we have in our leadership development literature that mm -hmm. perpetuate these models, um, we're going to get absolutely nowhere. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. sorry, yeah, go, Dennis. No, I, I was just going to say that you, you, you mentioned something about something about diversity um, within um, the, the company structure. And I was talking to... Um, what one of your colleagues, Dr. Meechan, and we were talking about it earlier, and you mentioned about um, the, the white male. Um, and the way I, I see it is really a false um, diversity. We're just trying to concentrate on ethnicity. And I think that some, sometimes when we talk about diversity, we tend to equate it with ethnicity and gender, and we tend to you know, forget about other things, such as you know, diversity of thoughts and diversity of skills and diversity of talents. Mm. And I, I think that's a really good point, Dennis. And I would go even further to um, diversities of experience, diversities mm. of, cog um, of cognitive capacity, diversity of where you've grown up, your backgrounds um, to, you know, you can, coming from the country, I see things very differently than, say, you know, people who look exactly like me who grew, grew up in the city. Um, I think that um, Dr. Meacham's work is amazing because she talks about workers with intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once you start looking at um, disabilities as, a, as an entire spectrum, mm -hmm. um, there is so much that we are missing out on because those voices are, are just not heard in any mm -hmm. way, shape or form. Um, and then if you want to, you know, move um, diversity more broadly, uh, thinking about um, uh, sexuality um, to, uh, uh, to family makeups, to uh, a whole broad gamut of um, uh, diversity that we need to start thinking about how we get more people able to engage in um, mainstream leadership work. Mm -hmm. And that probably means redefining what mainstream leadership work actually mm -hmm. looks like. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular individual or book which has the greatest influence to your work? That's a very good question. Um, 
listen, I think that there's in yes, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, for a lot of people, when you think about sort of the greatest influences, you'll think back a lot to childhood. So uh, mm-hmm. for me, I think teachers that I had um, during high school, again, you know, uh, going to a, um, a government um, school uh, that um, our, like, you know, for teachers to go above and beyond, they were doing it because they absolutely loved it. So people like Jeff Shaw and Glenn Calder, mm-hmm. um, Diane Mueller, um, uh, were just absolutely uh, incredible um, to me and um, uh, the entire time I was there and sort of engaged engaged my learning and wanting to um, to push me forward. Um, the other one I was thinking about is um, Beck Henrik, um, who ran leadership development camps. And so she was the first person to introduce me in, um, to servant leadership and got me thinking about leadership in a completely different way other than, I guess, that sort of glory of being the leader. You know, what is the lead? leadership for what what are we actually being there um as a leader like supreme leader <laughs> exactly exactly because you know that's what we see on tv yeah. you know with you know gr- growing up as a kid you know there's very clearly there's a leader of every group uh there's you know there's, uh, you know we don't we don't just we just assume that this this is you know this is how leadership plays out you know once we get out into the real world um you go oh there's actually some there's some issues uh with uh, how we how we go about um looking at this um, in terms of in terms of books, I think that there's a lot of really great authors out there. Um, listen, Jim Collins, good to great. Um, I really enjoyed what I'm um, reading that. I think Who Moved My Cheese is a great book, and uh, um, Brian Brown stuff is really important as well. Um, what I would say though is that for anyone who's picking up any different books or any you know listening to me or listening to anyone on your channel, um, you need to take bits and pieces from everyone. Mm-hmm. That at the end of the day. Um, I don't, you know, I don't want Dennis to go and be, um, an Elon Musk or a Simon Sinek. Um, you know, I don't want people going at home going, you know, I need to be an Indra Nui. I need to be a, um, Oprah Winfrey. Um, you need to be taking bits and pieces from all these different areas. So you can be the best Dennis leader that, you know, I can be the best Nathan leader that we, we can't, we don't need leaders who we've had in the past. We need leaders we haven't had before who have thought, you know, you're talking before diversity of thought, diversity of, um, of action, of, um, of beliefs, behaviors, all those sort of things. We need um, this melting pot of different leaders for us to move forward as a society. And as part of that, it means that we can't continue to create cookie cutter leaders. Mm-hmm. You, you mentioned about taking bits and pieces from different people. So when people come across your work and this interview, um, what would you say is the most important thing that you want the public to know about your work? The compassion in leadership works. Mm-hmm. That by putting your followers first and thinking, how do I do what is best by my followers? It's actually incredibly beneficial. Um, you mm-hmm. are not sacrificing profit. If anything, you're actually in- increasing profit because we know in the long term by putting your employees first you can increase your profits by 10 to 26 percent mm-hmm. that it increases innovation that it increases um uh, or, uh increases um retention in customers it increases employees staying within your organization that they have greater well-being that you have greater well-being that there's um greater work-life balance that there's less um work family conflicts below but there, there's mm. 140 odd different outcomes that um we've demonstrated that by not being a terrible human being no well by not um by putting your people first you end up putting your organization first Mm-hmm. You've um, been working. I'm sorry, I keep on cutting. <laughs> sorry, no, 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 no. There's plenty of organisational examples mm-hmm. that have demonstrated that. Southwest Airlines, I think, has had one quarter dip of profit, which was during the coronavirus, in their like 40 years of being. Mm-hmm. Um, TD Industries, um, uh, growing, growing, growing. Home Depot continues to grow, and they just, ha- you know, their their response to the coronavirus cr- coronavirus crisis, putting money into the communities, um, looking after all of their employees. Um, putting their employees first the entire time during this crisis, making sure that they're getting tested, making sure that they get access to food, to medical supplies, making sure that within, if that, if they are at work, if they are physically well enough to be at work, that they are socially distanced, that they're being looked after and they're not being exposed to coronavirus. Just these companies are able to both invest massively Mm -hmm. in their employees and communities and still have a lot of money left over for their shareholders 
And how is that not a really good model to follow? Mm -hmm. um, you, you've been working on the field of leadership development for a number of years. So I'm quite sure that you've encountered a number of misconceptions about leadership. And you've mentioned a, a few bits about, you know, the misconceptions. But um, other than those, what other misconceptions have you come across? And I suppose you take this as an opportunity to address those misconceptions. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very good question, Dennis. Um, I'll touch on a couple of areas, but I'll tell a quick story first. Mm -hmm. um, that I was running a leadership development workshop at a high school. This is about two years ago, um, two, two, three years ago. And um, we're getting people, we're talking about trait theory and the like, we're getting people at the front and like, oh, you know, do you think you're a leader? Do you think you're a leader? Do you think you're a leader? Um, you know, we're playing a game, having a bit of fun with it. And, um, I, you know, we're going through different people and I ask this girl, you know, she's put her hand up at the very beginning and went, oh, you know, do you, um, do you think you're a leader? And she's gone, no, I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe you're just playing with me. That's all right. I, you know, I, I, sit, uh, I see what you're trying to do here. And I oh, no, you know, um, you know, what, uh, uh, what, why not? She's gone, no, 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 seriously, I don't think I'm a leader. You know, why? Why? Said, because leaders don't look like me. She was um, second generation Chinese um, a woman growing up in Australia. She went, there, the leaders don't look like me. There isn't a leader I can look up to that I go, yep, I can be like that person. Mm -hmm. That worries, it still worries me today. I still tell the story today because it absolutely worries me. Representation matters. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you're talking about, you know, what are the misconceptions? Mm -hmm. um, the misconception to me is that people believe that, um, one, uh, that there are certain people who are leaders and there are certain people who are not. Mm -hmm. Everyone can be a leader. A leader is just a title. It is just a role. It is just mm -hmm. a whatever you, it's social construction. Mm -hmm. Anyone can engage in this particular process. Mm -hmm. If you can care deeply about trying to make the lives of your employees better, if you can set a vision and say, this is what we're going to achieve and this is how we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. um, how is, to me, that, you know, to any sort of definition, that influence, that is leadership. So this barrier that we tend to have to say, oh, you know, I can't be a leader because of X, Y, and Z, or, you know, um, uh, because of, you know, who, who I am or how I've grown up or where I've come from, we need to be absolutely mm -hmm. smashing that misconception straight away. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be smashing the misconception that some people are more dis, um, disposed to, um, to be a leader. So I know that there's a lot of research around um, mm -hmm. what personality traits are more likely to lead to leadership. And, you know, oh, taller people are more likely to be leaders or, you know, um, all of, there are so many of them. You Google them, you'll find heaps. Mm -hmm. The issue with that is that you are, the way in which we measure that is we measure it in terms of leader attainment. Have they gotten a leadership role? You know how it's, you know, it's really easy to get a leadership role. Um, if, you know, if you're in the 70s, the 60s, the 50s, if you're a white old male. Mm -hmm. So, of course, all these things correlated to being white, old and male. So, mm -hmm. of course, that we're sitting there going, oh, you know, people who are, um, who, are, who are tall, who have beards, who have whatever. All these things, you know, we say that they became leader-like because we researched a lot of this stuff in the time where there was only one type of leader. Mm -hmm. So that misconception that there is this great research out there to demonstrate that, you know, if you have this, this, and this, you're a leader, oh, it is seriously wrong. And you speak to any of the top leadership scholars in the world, they will tell you there are massive, massive holes within this particular set of research. Um, we're getting a little bit better at our genetics research, mm. but again, the genetics research and the genetic markers are still say, um, are still affected because we have to work out, you know, who we have to measure that leadership somehow. Mm -hmm. And generally, you know, because <laughs> because of second generation biases we have in organisations or biases that we have, you know, in ourselves about what we think a leader is. Um, again, allow a certain group of people to be heralded as leaders and other people not. So mm -hmm. we need to break that con um, that misconception that, um, you know, the, certain people are born leaders or if you have certain traits, you end up being a better leader than others because no, no, uh, anyone can engage in this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
The other thing that I would say is misconception is that you need to wait until you're older or you need to wait until you're, um, you know, in a management position to start learning about leadership or that, you know, you're too old to start learning about leadership or I've learned enough. Um, if I look at the work that Marco Lou has done um, with Ron Riggio and Susan Murphy out of uh, Claremont McKenna College, and um, if you do nothing else, go and look at the work that comes out of Claremont McKenna College and the Fullerton Leadership Studies. It is worth your time. They're fantastic. Um, and what they talk about is a lifespan approach to leadership. That leadership starts from when you were born, from how you are interacting as a baby, from the social skills you were learning at three, four years old, to um, when you're in the schoolyard and the different roles that you might take, you know, class captain, line captain. Do you hold any of those roles in like primary school or um, secondary uh, school, Dennis? Were you uh, any sort of captain, like a, um, a music yeah, captain? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all those things, you know, you know, that would have built, you know, helped build those particular leadership. So there's all those skills that you learn. And then in, you know, university, running student clubs or, you know, being involved in protests or marches or um, whatever that, whatever, whatever you're involved in at that stage. And then obviously, once you get into an organization um, through, it might be through community volunteering, it might be through leading teams, mm -hmm. um, going on leadership training camps, all those sort of things until you, you know, 60 plus, you might be retiring at 70, you might be, you know, managing your bowls club or you might be at your you know local lines or rotary club or probus clubs mm. there is so much leadership growth that we have in our entire lifetimes so a misconception that i want to absolutely smash is that there is an mm. optimal time to learn about leadership or people aren't ready to learn about leadership yet or people are too old to learn about leadership we learn about these things across our entire lives we just need to take some time to think about how these lessons influence the way in which we lead. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Nathan, I have to be honest with you. You put a slight dent on, on, on my misconception that um, I think I would need more convincing because I think I'm on the side of those people who think that not everyone can be a leader. I'm convinced that I can't be a leader because I think for, for you to be a leader, you've got to possess a certain attribute. And just like you told me that that needs to be smart, but I'm still on that side, I think that a leader should be strong, a leader should be resilient, and, and a leader has got to have this charisma. And I myself, I'm not convinced that I've got the right charisma and, and, and resilience to be a leader. That's why I ended up being a freelancer. I can't even work for, for, for a company. Um, I, I hate working for other people. That's why I ended up being a content creator. And you also mentioned something about um, representation. It's, it's a lovely anecdote, you know, like a, a Chinese and saying that, um, I, I can't be a, I can't it's hard for me to be a leader because I can't see someone who looks like me and obviously I'm 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 also of um um I, I also have um Chinese ethnicity I'm I'm I mix um but you, you know coming here in the UK and I'm also one of those of course when we talk about leadership it's not just about com corporate leadership it's also about political leadership I'm one mm. of those people I'm one of those minority I, I suppose I'm I'm a curious anomaly that when I look at people, I don't really care whether they're all white, whether I, I don't really care whether I don't see any brown or any yellow in, 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 in the people that, you know, put position of power and representation. I don't really care. What I care about is, I don't care whether they look like me. What I care is about, are they qualified to do that? Do they have the right skill and experience to do that? So I, I tend not to agree with your idea of representation. No, uh, listen, that's, that's completely fine. And I'll, I'll talk about representation. I'll go back to charisma that you talked about before. Um, with that, just because it's not important for one particular person doesn't mean that it's not important for a lot of others. Mm -hmm. And the more and more that I read, the more and more I talk to people, um, the more and more I look at even social, uh, even models of how mm. we learn and how we develop, mm. the more and more that's solidified in my mind that, um, that rep representation does matter, that you cannot be what you cannot see. Mm. I think that we're, we're in a world that is a lot better now because of social media, because of, mm -hmm. um, you know, the people beaming into, like the importance of um, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is mm. huge worldwide, not just for the people of New York, but to be able um, for a lot of people to be able to see um, themselves 
in that. Um, I really love, there was a video that, um, it, um, that Philip Sue, uh, I don't know if you've watched Hamilton, Dennis, but um, I've, Hamilton, I've heard of it, yeah. you've heard of it, you know, yeah. Um, Philip Sue was on um, Hamilton and um, uh, she was one of the leads in that and she, her daughter, um, who's about two or three years old, was watching it. And there's a video of her recording her daughter watching it and her daughter pointing at um, her mum and going, oh, that's me, that's me, that's me. That, you know, she can see that, she can see someone who looks like her and um and she automatically knows that i can go and do this particular thing because i'm seeing someone um who's who is doing this who's being able to um you know engage in this and if, i guess from a research perspective mm -hmm. that we've seen countless examples that this is important i think that with any social sciences it's mm -hmm. not like medicine um you know i like my medicine to be 99 percent effective um i don't you know uh, if, i don't want it to be 60 percent effective i want it to be 99 mm -hmm. percent with social sciences we're a lot more happier with you know 60 percent of the time or 50 percent mm -hmm. of the time um to me it's still well you know at the end of the day it's still more than half the population mm -hmm. Are sitting there going well representation does matter and it does influence their um their want uh mm -hmm. to go on to take on a leadership role um and their motivation too and their feeling and that leader identity that you know mm -hmm. part of my identity can be part of a leader and so listen i agree with you that you know um for you individually uh mm -hmm. yeah listen completely fine and everyone is going to see that differently and everyone's going to see it on a spectrum differently mm -hmm. and that's great that's fantastic mm -hmm. um i know that there's a lot of people who don't and i know there's a, there's not a lot of people who are in my roles that we don't have a lot of diversity in academia um uh that there is still a lot of big issues with diversity in academia mm -hmm. and it's important that we are talking a lot about diversity even if we are not diverse individuals because it's the only way as a society we end up moving forward. Are you happy with that answer, Dennis? Yeah, I am happy with that. Um, no, I, 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 I love talking to people with, with, with different opinions. Um, you, you certainly work on a stressful area. So on a lighter note, um, <laughs> Dr. Eva, how do you re relax with your distressing outlet? Well, Dennis, 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 uh, before you change the subject, you said before <laughs> that you don't see yourself as charismatic. Buddy, I am sure that the people who are there watching at home with DIH right now are saying, are you kidding me? You're an incredibly charismatic guy. Mm -hmm. um, but I am going to say that if anyone who is at home right now wants to work on their charisma, mm -hmm. um, Google uh, right now, uh, John Antonakis, A N T O N A. K I S. There's a um, beautiful article in Harvard Business Review. You'll be able to read it for free, um, which talks about how to improve your charisma. Mm -hmm. Now, generally, I would say you don't do articles that, you know, say the four steps of this, the five steps of mm -hmm. this. What I really like about John's work is that he's gone and um, He's gone and tested this. And so what he's done is he scientifically tested each of these particular components. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, he talks about these different charismatic techniques, about lists of threes, um, about our uh, comparisons, our uh, to her moral, um, so talking about specific morals. And he's tested each one of those to be able to demonstrate the mm -hmm. increase in perceived charisma and the increase in performance by adding each of these things to your leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he's done, um, so the experiments are really interesting that he gets people to deliver speeches, trains them in these particular mm -hmm. areas, gets them to deliver other speeches, sends those uh, sends those out to um, people to rate and you know the ratings come back off the charts. Um, so you can improve your charisma. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting about his studies is that he's able to, um, through these different areas, he's created something called a charismometer mm -hmm. where you can put that in the text of any particular speech and it tells you what percentage of charisma that speech gives you. Obviously, you know, that there's a bit of brand delivery that you need to do, but a lot of charisma comes down to how we structure our sentences, what we say. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was trying to come up with a third one for you, but I didn't have one for you there. Yeah, how, what, you know, how we structure it um, and what, what we say. I, I'll supply it for you. Um, being introvert or extrovert. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, being introvert or extrovert. Oh, yeah. um, I, I think I, that, that also forms, um, um, you know, one, one of the components of charisma. 
Listen, John would say no. John would say no, and he would uh, he would ask me specifically to make sure I say to your <laughs> listeners, no, no, that personality and charisma that you shouldn't be looking at that as a link because mm. ca- um, charisma can be learned. Charisma is mm. a skill, as with anything else. And so, as an introvert or an extrovert, um, you can engage in that. Mm. Um, it's interesting that you bring this up, Dennis, because a lot of people, I get asked this question a lot. Oh, you know, can introverts be leaders? Introverts generally are the best leaders because they understand their followers a lot more. They spend time listening. Yeah, I, I, um, I am an introvert, but I really don't like being around with people. <laughs> so that's, I think that that would be one of the main impediment of, you know, me being a leader because I don't like being in a big group of people. That's all right. You don't need to be in a big group of people. Yeah, so that's just, what I'm saying. It's, 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 difficult, it's difficult to manage a group of people if you don't want to be around with them in the first place. That is, okay, that is true. Yeah. We're getting very good about not being around people right now in the COVID <laughs> environment. Um, but if you think about, if you think about, listen, leading a group of five, yes, there's mm. going to be some times you've got to have meetings as a whole. But mm. A lot of the best leadership work is this one-on-one. And, you know, if you're feeling comfortable enough having this one-on-one conversation, um, mm. that is, that's going to be your 80% of your leadership. You get this part right um, mm. with each individual. Um, everything else, you know, everything else will fall into place. Mm-hmm. Now, um, Dr. Eva, you elegantly um, escaped my question earlier. Um, how <laughs> you really are. So um, we're interested. Uh, what, what's, um, what's Dr. Eva behind uh, research and his passion for leadership development? What's your distressing outlet? Uh, so I live five minute walk from the beach. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it is really cold right now, but I was down there earlier today for a walk. Um, so I will, yeah, so I try, the beach is really good as a de-stressor, uh, de-stressor for me. Mm-hmm. Um, if we think sort of mindfulness research, um, mm-hmm. wherever you fall on the, um, you know, agree, disagree to mindfulness research, that's fine. But mm-hmm. for me, I do like that sort of the tactile nature of being the sand, the water and the like. So I find that really, um, really good. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big sport fan, so I love sitting down um, watching my team. Unfortunately, being a Melbourne Demons supporter here in uh, uh, in Australia, my team has historically been very bad. So I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it unwinds me or just makes me more stressed. But uh, it definitely makes me forget about the emails and forget about everything that goes on at that time. Um, and I also really I'm. My wife and I are big fans of movies in general. So I've been going through lately a lot of the old 40s and 50s and 60s movies and the like and, um, you know, discovering I'd never watched Hitchcock before this year. And I know, I know I'm a bad <laughs> Incidentally, person. Incidentally, I watched that last night. Um, I, I was watching a Hitchcock film, 1938, with my husband last, ah. last night. I forgot the, I forgot the name. Um, um, the lady banishes, and my husband is behind me. He just oh. whispered it to my ear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, what? So, what, listen, we could we could watch. I uh, might watch yeah. that one tonight. Uh, still, Rear Window for me was spectacular. Mm. I could not could not believe how good that film was. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's been really interesting going back watching a lot of um, watching a lot of old films, um, mm-hmm. and that's been quite relaxing as well. So it's yeah, it's uh, I mean yeah, a couple of things to you know unwind. Mm-hmm. We, we, we've got something in common. Um, now, wh- where do you see yourself 10 years from now? I'm all for setting 10-year goals. I'm mm. absolutely all for setting 10-year goals. And I have very clear five-year goals. Like I've got Excels of five-year goal plans. Mm-hmm. Um, 10 years, I'm probably not there at the moment. I don't, I don't think I've got a clear idea, um, idea mm. as yet. I think that, you know, I'm 32, so we've got a lot of, you know, my wife and I, we've got a lot of uh, life stage stuff that's going to come up over the next 10 years. So I think that's going to massively throw a spanner in whatever plans that I have. Um, but for me, as long as I'm doing something that's helping people, um, if I'm helping people and, and mm-hmm. I can wake up every morning and say, yes, what I'm doing today is going to make a difference mm-hmm. um, to people, no matter how small, then I'm, I'm all right with what I'm doing. So um, yeah, uh, hopefully not in lockdown, Dennis. That's, yeah. you know, <laughs> that might. Um, so yeah, try Yeah. Just trying to do, trying to do some good work. Mm-hmm. And finally, um, Dr. Eva, what else is in the pipeline? So 
A couple of, couple of interesting pieces, a couple of interesting pieces. Um, uh, Dr. Meacham and I are working on a piece around uh, leading workers with intellectual disabilities, mm-hmm. um, which I'm really, really excited about. And uh, as soon as we get that one published, we'll be um, straight to you, Dennis. We'll be getting it out via um, your channels. It, uh, it's just a really interesting, interesting piece um, around how we have to change up the way in which we lead um, uh, and the way in which we work together um, and leading workers with intellectual disabilities. Um, I, it's a really, a really, really cool piece that Han, um, mm-hmm. Hannah's leading. Um, I've got a piece at the moment that we've taken um, we've taken all these different leadership approaches. So, uh, Dennis, how many leadership models do you think there is, just out of interest sake? How many do you reckon there are leadership theory, uh, uh, leadership models? Like usually, leadership. Yeah, usually in anything there's a magic number, three or five, but I'll go for five. Yeah, with five. We've currently got 60-odd in the in uh in the theories we have about 60 theories of leadership imagine going to a doctor and saying doctor i have a headache and the doctor saying well here are 60 things 60 medications i can give you that basically do about the same thing it's insane so myself and a colleague we've been working on um uh, working on this piece, it's huge, taking us so long to do, to try and bring these down mm-hmm. and to try and work out, well, what is what is the core common component? Mm-hmm. Um, and we've somewhat got an answer to that. Um, essentially, that a lot of these theories do about the same thing. Mm-hmm. So for any, um, any of your uh, listeners at home who are, you know, going through, going, oh, you know, what leadership course should I do? Or, you know, what model of leadership should I emulate? To a certain extent, it looks looks like about 95% of all these different leadership models we talk about. And, you know, there's a new one every minute, you know, I think we're at uh, neuro leadership at the moment. I think it's the, um, the is taken over from mindfulness leadership is the new, new cool thing. It's about 95% the same and does the, um, the exact same thing as every other leadership approach that we've really had out there that the majority of these things all do pretty much the same predict very much the same thing. Yes, there's a little bit of bits and pieces on the side, about one or two percent, and that is important. You know, when we're talking, you know, millions of dollars, that's a you know, that's a big percentage. But for the most part, it's pretty much the same. Mm-hmm. So again, um, taking a lot of these things with a grain of salt, choose the bits that you like, ignore mm-hmm. the bits that you don't. Anything with moderation. Um, and the final part is we're working on a piece at the moment, looking at um, when to bring out different emotions in your leadership. Uh, uh, toolkit. So, you know, sometimes you might need to get a little bit angry. Sometimes you need to show a little bit more compassion. Um, so looking at when employees do uh, unethical acts, um, when, how, um, mm-hmm. when to use um, anger, when to use compassion, because uh, that's one of the really, to me, it's a really tough thing, you know, um, when do I need to get a little bit cranky and when do I need to um, go, okay, listen, I'm, I'm angry inside, but I need to put my anger one side and you know, be a compassionate human being. So, you know, when when's the right time to pull which um, which lever? So, uh, yeah, uh, working on those at the moment. So, a bit bit of fun. Mm-hmm. Well, it's been an insightful conversation with you, Dr. Um, Eva, but unfortunately our time is up. I look forward to hearing more about your work, about those, you know, trying to squeeze together those um, di- different theories of um, leadership. Um, thank you. And... Um, Hopefully, I get to publish your research, your piece on Psychrage. Thank you. I, I hope so too. Thank you, thank you so much, Dennis, and thank you so much for the work that you're doing with Psychrage. It's, it's incredibly important getting um, getting the word out there. So thank you so much for all that, and it's been a pleasure having to chat, getting to chat to you today. Thank you. Thanks, man.